Today we have Kevin Walling presenting stream quality analysis and monitoring of the proposed interstate pipeline through George Washington National Forest. Dr. Benson is an advisor. Uh, please give him your undivided attention and wait to ask questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today and your interest in the proposed interstate pipeline through the George Washington National Forest. So in our world today, there's an ever-growing demand to, uh, for energy to meet our growing population's daily needs. Since the discovery of natural gas, this clean, burning, efficient fossil fuel has been developed and used in many applications, such as in our homes, offices, uh, businesses, factories, and power plants. While using this uh, fossil fuel may be of our best interest, uh, it is the transportation of this natural gas that is um, of the utmost concern on its uh, impacts on our environment. Our main issue is the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the environmental <coughs> impacts that it may pose on the environment and its ecosystems. With this prominent pipeline being proposed to be implemented, um, the inevitably comes the land disturbances and the environmental impacts associated with the construction. And some of these possible impacts were released in December 2016 under its federal review by the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission in its environmental impact statement. And it said that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, would cross 1,989 water bodies, including 1,878 streams, 64 canals and ditches, and 47 open water ponds and reservoirs. One of the obvious environmental uh, impacts associated with implementing a pipeline as such would be the stream crossings and the construction that happens during these. Some of the stream crossings uh, include wet crossing methods and dry crossing methods. This is just an overview of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Uh, as you can see, it stretches from West Virginia, goes down through Virginia, and then ends into North Carolina. With a large-scale project such as implementing a pipeline spanning over three states, there inevitably comes uh, going to be opposing uh, views from the differing sides. Uh, the large-scale energy companies such as Dominion Resources and Duke Energy, uh, as well as Piedmont Natural Gas and the Southern Company Gas, insist on implementing this pipeline. These energy companies are focusing on an alternative, more efficient, and the most economically feasible way to uh, provide access to additional low-cost natural gas supplies in Virginia and North Carolina. On the opposing side, there's uh, many environmental <coughs> citizen groups that are opposing the implementation of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Uh, these groups include the Augusta County Alliance, um, Appalachian Voices, which is a environmental nonprofit group, uh, Virginia Council of Trout Unlimited, <coughs> and the Virginia Chapter of Backcountry Horsemen of America. In addition, federal and state agencies involved is the US Forest Service, as well as the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, all of which are concerned of the effects that pose to their community and surrounding environments from the construction associated with this pipeline. Although these stakeholders uh, listed are uh, very are uh, important, uh, the utmost concern is with the actual Augusta County residents themselves. Uh, these people are worried about the actual impacts that the pipeline may have. It's where they live, it's where they grew up, and they don't want a pipeline running right through their backyard. Some issues of concern, other than the stream crossings associated with the pipeline. Um, having been in the Shenandoah Valley, it uh, encompasses uh, the general landscape, has a karst terrain, and this means that it's very unstable terrain. It's porous, it's home to limestone. Uh, there's many sinkholes and caves present and all of which are concerned during construction. After construction, once the sediment settles and uh, sinkholes can develop, and there actually has been uh, uh, times where the sed uh, sediment has settled and uh, the pipelines may break or leak and possible explosions have been seen. Also just in the general landscape of the Shenandoah Valley and the Appalachian Mountain Range, uh, steep slopes, so Constructing these pipelines on these steep slopes may increase the erosion, increase erosion, destroy habitats, and threaten native species found in the area. The overall goal of my project is to monitor and uh, measure the water quality of two streams in the George Washington National Forest. In accordance to this project, I also worked with Trout Unlimited, 
and as a volunteer water quality monitor. Uh, Trout Unlimited has created the West Virginia Virginia Water Quality Monitoring Project, which focuses on training volunteers such as myself as engaging citizen scientists as the eyes and ears on the ground, monitoring uh, the cold water resources such as the streams and the potential impacts that may be uh, posed from the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Uh, monitoring site locations. Uh, through the Trout Unlimited's Water Quality Monitoring Project, I attended a training program. I met Jake Lemon, who is the Eastern Shale Gas uh, Coordinator there. I received the proper monitoring techniques uh, used to perform the field experiments, as well was issued the proper field equipment. As you can see here, this is the gravelometer and a conductivity measure. It measures the water temperature as well as the air temperature. After having this training session, I sat down with Dr. Benzing and Jake Lemon, and we um, made monitoring site uh, locations and selections based upon the proposed pipeline route, bracketing uh, the specific site locations so that we have monitoring sites above and below the pipeline crossings of the streams. We chose two different streams, Hodges Draft and Ramsey's Draft, both of which are located in Augusta County, Virginia. I used a uh, geospatial analysis application uh, called Model My Watershed and was able to determine that Ramsey's Draft uh, watershed is roughly 37 kilometers squared while Hodges Draft is 24 kilometers squared, which is a little bit smaller than Ramsey's Draft. Both streams are considered headwater streams in that they encompass narrow, fast-flowing, deeper stream channels, and numerous bed bedrock formations were um, along each stream channel. After documenting these uh, results monthly, uh, spanning from April 2016 to March 2017, I uploaded all the data obtained from Hodges Draft on the sitside.org. There was already uh, monitors that had uh, established monitoring sites on Ramsey's Draft, so I collected my own samples on Ramsey Draft for further analysis. As for sitsi.org, this is a national database that is used by Trout Unlimited and allows uh, citizen scientists such as volunteer monitors to upload all their data. This then allowed Trout Unlimited to collectively analyze and collect all the data from the various monitors in the area. As you can see, it's a, a lot larger project than just mine. Uh, currently, they have 143 members 441 different monitoring site locations and has received, o received over 26,000 measurements to date. It also has uh, different forums for resources to use, maps, analysis. Using Google Earth, I was able to depict the three monitoring sites, three on Hodges Draft and three on Ramsey's Draft of my sh two streams that I've chosen. As you can see, these are adjacent watersheds uh, located near West Augusta, Virginia, and they both flow to the Cavapastra River. Hodges Draft flows from the first monitoring site to the second to the third, and Ramsey's Draft flows from the third monitoring site to the second to the first. As you can see down in the rectangle at the bottom, this is the third monitoring site located on Hodges Draft, which will be of further importance in the next slide. This is the proposed pipeline crossing and this is crossing just above uh, the third monitoring site on Hodges Draft. Hodges Draft runs right down through here, as you can see. Uh, the road crosses right about here, and that's where the monitoring site is. The yellow lines uh, depicted is the corridor that the proposed pipeline route is supposed to take. So monitoring took place every month, uh, usually on the first Sunday. Uh, for all six monitoring locations, three on Hodges, three on Ramsey's. Uh, basic water quality parameters uh, were established measuring the pH, water temperature, uh, air temperature, the stream stage, as well as the conductivity and the turbidity. Uh, the conductivity uh, measures the water's ability to pass an electric current. is also known as a bulk uh, parameter in that it measures a variety of contamin contaminants in the water. Uh, the turbidity also measures the suspended materials and sediment in the water and how they affect the um, light passing through it. Along with these measurements taken, I also collected water samples in the fall and spring and sent them to a contracted lab uh, through to you. It was actually right down the road at Eastern Mennonite University where they checked for quality assurance and control with our measurements. 
Here's just some average parameters uh, that were collected from Hodges draft and Ramsey's draft respectively. Um, as you can see, the conductivity measurements for uh, Ramsey's draft was a little bit lower than uh, measured on Hodges draft, and this was due to the watershed size and the ability that Ramsey's draft had more water in its stream channel to dilute the concentrations. Uh, pH, pHs were very, uh, very similar. Uh, the, received very low turbidity uh, levels. And there, why it's not actually zero is because there's only one high flow event that we measured where the turbidity using a transparency tube did not measure greater than 120 centimeters. Uh, this means that the water clarity in both streams is very clear. So in a way to characterize the stream bed composition, I also conducted a pebble count using the gravelometer. Um, at each monitoring site on Hodges draft and one on Ramsey's draft. Uh, the composition and size of particles in the stream bed influences many aspects correlated to uh, the stream, such as uh, channel formation, uh, erosion rates, sediment supply, and aquatic uh, habitat. Using a gravelometer and a tape measure, as you can see, I measured out a 100 foot span uh, at each monitoring site in this. Uh, depiction kind of depicts there's 10 different transects over the 100 uh, foot span and I measured 10 different particles at each transect totaling 100 particles at each monitoring site. In this graph you can see the results obtained from my pebble count. We're looking at the particle size uh, range in millimeters uh, as opposed to the percent that I calculated or obtained from the measurements. As you can see, um, sand and silt range from roughly zero to four millimeters. Uh, pebbles range from four millimeters to roughly 64 millimeters, and then cobbles from 64 to 180, and then uh, boulders are ranging greater than 180 millimeters. As a result from these uh, measurements, you can see the first monitoring location on Hodges Draft furthest up in the mountains, and the second resemble the headwater streams in that uh, most of their uh, particles measured were in the boulders or greater than 180 range. And usually in headwater streams, they have uh, larger particles associated with them due to their fast flowing and ability to transport the smaller sediment and materials downstream. At the third monitoring location uh, on Hodges Draft, you can see the uh, most particles measured were in the 64 millimeter range, and this is due to the ability of the stream pushing some of the smaller particles down. Also, the first and second uh, monitoring locations were farthest up in the mountains, and as the third uh, monitoring site, it flows through an agriculture area, the stream opens up a little bit, and it's not prone to as many trees and vegetation. As you can also see, the woody debris decreased as you go down as well and that follows just the ability of the water to pass down through the stream. With this uh, graph, you can also see uh, excess fine sediment, um, four millimeters and smaller, uh, states that there was human-induced erosion, and right now you can see that there is none at all. <coughs> And here depicted is the conductivity levels uh, measured over the year span. I established two monitoring sites, one on the impacted stream and one on the control stream. Overall, the conductivity levels followed a similar trend uh, as opposed to time and seasonal changes. As you can see, low flow events. We did see a change in the conductivity, conductivity levels during the fall, and this was due to low flow events as well as uh, leaf and litter. Uh, leaf and litter uh, decomposition in the streams found. And as you can see, this data was before the impact occurred, which I would be measuring the, the baseline data of the before. And you might also notice that a change, um, so you might wonder how I would establish a change or see a change if, when the pipeline is implemented with the construction. And in the literature, there is a well-established design called the Bakke design. And this design, or the Bakke design, is 
uh, called the Before After Control Impact Design. It's an environmental impact assessment that focuses on anthropogenic disturbances or human impacts on the environment. Uh, in this case, it's focusing on the stream uh, crossing disturbances and contaminants that may be associated with them in the future. It can detect, su uh, detect subtle biological changes in response to disturbances and also reliably um, separates the effects of specific anthropogenic activity from those of natural occurrences. For this, for this specific design, it measures the constant difference between the impact and control stream <coughs> in before and after period. It compares that constant difference that was seen between the control and impact stream and relates it to the after period. As you can see here, there is a constant difference. Here's the impact stream, here's the control stream, this is before and after. And it measures the constant difference that is measured in between this distance right here as opposed to a change that may be seen in the after period. So, from these graphs that I have depicted above, as you can see, this is just my baseline conductivity levels obtained for Hodges draft and Ramsey draft of the two different monitoring site locations. Both streams follow similar trends uh, as opposed to seasonal changes and natural occurrences, but they did not follow the same constant difference throughout the whole year span. And this can be better displayed in this graph over here. Hodges draft reflects the impacted stream as it has a more drastic change as opposed to the control stream, which would be Ramsey's draft, in that they both change, but the, the difference in which they change is not the same throughout. And that leads me down to the average abundance versus the difference. And here I took the average conductivity level between both streams and averaged them together and compared them to the difference in between both streams. Here you can see that the trend is forming here and is present. And this is a problem when identifying um, environmental impacts using the BASI design uh, because this trending uh, formation is an indication of the constant change. So in order to reduce this trend, I performed a transformation on the data. And this transformation on the data uh, limits the various physical and natural factors affecting both streams. So you can see this transform transformation on the data in the average log abundance graph. And as you can see, uh, this transformation put the data in a scale that it's not drastically affected by the natural um, factors that are present in the world today. And uh, the trend actually leveled out a little bit and the slope decreased. And so when using the BASI design, uh, if you were to see an impact in the future, uh, the impact would be seen as the uh, trend line would be increasing or decreasing and there would be a change in the slope present, and that's how you can detect if there is a change due to uh, construction during the in-stream crossings. So for some concluding remarks, overall from my analysis, results, and findings, I can conclude that Ramsey's draft and Hodges draft uh, encompass a healthy uh, stream water quality. Uh, from the pebble counts conducted, uh, these reflected my turbidity measurements that I measured as well uh, in a sense that the particles measured were larger and with the turbidity uh, measurements taken uh, were very low which had a very high water, cl water clarity which allowed the smaller sediment to be passed downstream. As for the conductivity um, measurements, uh, both streams followed seasonal changes as well as natural occurrences such as precipitation events and mimicked each other pretty well. Um, but most importantly, um, the baseline for Hodges draft and Ramsey's draft uh, stream quality data was recorded and documented. And this can be used for my project and the future of this project, as well as for Hodges draft data was uploaded for, um, uploaded and collected for Trout Unlimited's uh, West Virginia, Virginia water quality monitoring project, which can be used in future analysis of their larger scale, scale project. Some recommendations that I have for the future of this project. Um, just make sure that the accurate results are obtained, um, making them necessary, uh, are necessary for the larger project that is uh, being encompassed through the Trout Unlimited program. 
uh, allowed for proper calibration uh, with the Lamont tester. It took a little bit of time on the stream to actually calibrate and find the actual measurements, but those are important as well. And also, we ran into a problem with the pH uh, during precipitation events, during monitoring. Uh, make sure no water gets into the pH containers as well. Ran into a problem there. Um, I just want to wish good luck to Eric Razor, who will be continuing this project in the future um, next year. And hopefully, he'll be able to document any environmental impacts associated with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. I want to thank Dr. Benzing for his continued support, uh, helping me go out and monitor um, the various sites every month. Uh, going out in the field and counting numerous bears on several occurrences, uh, revising and editing all my presentations and uh, reports, and just the mentoring throughout the whole process of this uh, project. I also want to thank Kyle Snow for his help in the environmental lab, uh, getting all the necessary equipment every month, and uh, helping out with the pH experiment that we conducted for the water in the container. I also want to uh, thank Jake Lemon, who is the Eastern Shale Gas Coordinator, he uh, helped me uh, with the proper methods in conducting the in-stream analysis and also provided the necessary equipment when needed uh, throughout the process of this project. Just want to thank you all for coming today and I uh, hope you have a great day. Any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, just one. Um, how What's the difference between a, uh, a wet crossing and a, a dry crossing for when they install? Pipes? Yeah, there's uh, several different methods used. Yeah, or maybe just like an overall uh, general explanation between the two. Yeah, a dry crossing method would be where you cross where the stream bed is dry, okay. and a wet crossing method is where you would, there's different methods like a, a flume and all that kind of stuff where you block off one side and let the stream wrap around, okay. and then once you establish that, uh, section of the stream, then you block off the other side and have the stream run. So dry crossing methods are preferred okay. because it's not as much erosion going into the water, increasing okay. sediment deposition. Thank you. Pull up your conductivity graph for a minute. I just want to explore. Yep. So if if Eric continues this project and he gets this one. Yeah, uh, go to the one that actually shows the difference in transform there, that data. Yep. <coughs> so that's a year's worth of data out there in the upper left-hand corner. Correct. And like you described, the data show that Hodge's draft responds. With a more drastic change. Yeah, the due amplitude to the, of the response is higher. So basically, And that's due to the smaller watershed size and the inability of the water to dilute the concentrations. So if they put this pipeline in, and as a result of putting the pipeline in, they stir up a bunch of sediment and you know change the stream channel in such a way that the conductivity levels go up. Yeah. How is that data going to look when you transform it? Transform what, what's going to happen? Uh, the trend line, as you can see down here, yeah, uh, would actually increase. And that's this. What this reflects is the difference in between uh, the levels measured between Hodges draft and Ramsey's draft. So, the way that you can detect using the Bossy design, would there the trend line would be increasing as well as the slope. You can see a change in an increasing slope. And it, it may also be. It could decrease as well. Yeah, that that might be it. Well, if the conductivity is going to increase, and I agree with you, the slope is probably going to increase. The other thing is it might actually shift up. Yes. Right, so the total difference may change at all points. That can be seen in this one where in the before period, you have two straight lines, and after an impact, it actually shifts down. Yeah, that, that would be one where it goes down, but you could also have the difference go up and go up. I think the next slide actually shows that, right there. Yep. So the difference might go up when we install the pipeline. Correct. So not just the slope, but also the position of that line might actually change. Make a drastic jump as well. Does that make sense, Eric? Any other questions? Yep. Uh, given your findings, are you at all concerned about the continuation of the construction of the pipeline? Uh, it is proposed right now, so it hasn't. No ground has been broken yet. 
Um, definitely with the stream crossings, it's going to cross 1,900 water bodies uh, over its 564 mile course uh, during construction. So, yeah, there definitely is going to be some uh, impacts associated with the stream crossings because that's they have to cross the stream somehow. So it's definitely going to increase the sediment deposition downstream. It may change the aquatic habitats that are associated within the brook trout, which were present in both streams. So definitely will have an effect. Anything else?